uh, I can't prove that we don't have a constitution anymore, and I, uh, and I'm not sure I would want to, but I can give you a few vignettes. I think of that indicates if it's not if it's not dead, it's at least sick or uh, ailing. Uh, these examples, I'm giving examples mostly from uh, the question of what the rule of law means in the Constitution and what we're doing today about, uh, with respect to that. And I will give uh, three, broad, uh, three areas I want to talk about. One, the intelligence agencies. Second, the judiciary. And finally, the response of governments at, uh, at all levels to the COVID panic. My focus isn't so much on this or that particular clause of the Constitution, but rather uh, the big picture. The Constitution, as Americans have understood its broad meaning and purpose through most of our history. And by broad meaning, I mean uh, it, the Constitution is, the, is a foundational document, our foundational document, and does two things. Establishes a Republican form of government for the, for the nation and rules the people through laws that are, are meant to apply equally to persons equally situated, similarly situated, uh, and and the uh, and and these laws uh, approved by elected officials are meant to provide protection for life, liberty, and property. And I'll amend that to say temperate liberty and responsible ownership and use of property. This is the how. This is the, the way. This is the way the Constitution has been broadly understood. In uh, in 2017, after Trump's election, he criticized the claim made by the FBI, the CIA, and other intelligence agencies that Russia had interfered in his election. Uh, Trump said nonsense. Uh, at uh, at that point, Senate Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer uh, told Rachel Maddow that Trump is, quote, being really dumb, unquote, to say that. Quote, and now, and now I'll quote the money quote from Schumer. Let me tell you, you take on the intelligence community, they have six ways from Sunday at getting back at you, end quote. That, I think, uh, is, a, is a vivid statement uh, of where we are in regard to the rule of law and relation to the intelligence agencies. Basically, Schumer was boasting that about uh, you know that didn't matter that Trump had been elected. They were, these intelligence agencies are going to find a way to harm him because he had said things that they did not like. He was said, uh, and which really implies that in in a really important case like who's president and who and what what the president gets to do, uh, the consent of the governed is not the primary consideration. Intelligence agencies, uh, if, they, if intelligence agencies can harm elected officials at will when they deviate from the line laid down by the ruling class, then, uh, then the consent of the government has been replaced by something different. And, uh, and at the same time, if, they were, if, they are able, if, the if the agencies are able to harm Trump or anyone, uh, the uh, they, they would, that implies they have the power to deny the protection of the laws to anyone. He just happens to be the most prominent at that moment and the most important from their point of view. They have six ways of, from, from Sunday to get their way on anyone. If Schumer is right, the two main things that the state and federal constitutions were designed to do are being denied. First, government is supposed to secure these rights through even-handed prosecutions and punishments of the criminal law and uh, civil law, but, and, and especially with the protections of due process and equal protection. The idea that uh, citizens have a, a right to defend themselves when accused and that there are, uh, and that the laws will be applied equally. equally people will be equally protected, no, uh, meaning uh, whoever commits a crime will be prosecuted no matter what the class, sex, race status is of the criminal, and similarly, the race, sex, or, cl sex or class, class status of the victim. Uh, if Schumer is right, though, then this, the state, these, this is being denied uh, because the, um, in the way that I've just described. The, <clears throat> these policies 
what is it that these intelligence agencies care about, I can summarize in this way. Uh, what, they, what the intelligence agencies want, and of course lots of allies in the federal bureaucracy as well as the states, uh, and elected, among elected officials too to some degree, is uh, they want a government uh, that uh, supports, that, whose policies abroad spread the liberal world order all over the world, uh, it's our idea of liberty is to be every is to be uh, is to be spread everywhere if need be by force of arms. Uh, uh, something that Trump questioned in the campaign. Uh, the the government uh, that, that they prefer it uh, pushes policies that support special privileges for the disadvantaged, including blacks, Latinos, women, gays, and so on, and. They also promote policies that, uh, pr that, that advance the ever more radical separation of sex from marriage and the denial of politically relevant differences between men and women. This was not a theme in the campaign, it, 2016 campaign, uh, but it is an ongoing theme in our, in our political life and, these, uh, and the people who, who are in these positions to be able to harm are very concerned and committed to those causes. Now, I should add, finally, that while being committed to doing good for others in these ways, as they see doing good to others as they see it, there is always, what one notices, a concern for one's own doing good for oneself. Uh, looking for a job maybe in Raytheon or in some NGO that pays lots of money or maybe CNN, there's this, uh, there's this constant churn between politics and, uh, and, and uh, the private sector, so-called private sector, in these ways, which, uh, which, which, which one sees, especially in these intelligence agencies. Lots of ex-agents, ex lots of ex-employees appear on networks, uh, TV networks. Uh, so, but, but this is the thing. The rule of law is so fundamental to the Constitution that it, that it, that it accounts for the basic structure of government itself. Article one, the legislature is supposed to make the laws. Article two, the executive protects the people's liberty and property by taking care that the law be faithfully executed. And then article three, judiciary, under the laws passed by Congress, they are supposed to determine the legal rights of individuals in prosecutions and lawsuits. Today, if the intelligence agencies decide that they disapprove of the laws or the president's faithful execution of the laws or judicial determinations of cases under law, they have the power to prevent that from, uh, from, from being done by threatening or actually harming members of any of the three branches. Uh, now, I mentioned Trump, the case of Trump. There are many other cases. Uh, you know, Tim Weiner, in his book on the CIA, talks about the way that the CIA was involved in destroying the career of Joseph McCarthy. It's, this has been going on a long time. Uh, our lunch, time, lunch speaker has, found, has looked into the role of the CIA and the FBI in the, what became almost the impeachment of Nixon, the de definitely driving him out of office. So that was, that's all, this has been happening for, for quite a while. Now, as it turned out in the Trump case, he was right and Schumer was also right. Uh, that is, Tr the, the two-year Mueller investigation found no evidence of Russia collusion which means that the claim made by the, quote, 17 intelligence agencies, unquote, during the 2016 campaign was proven false or wildly exaggerated. And the Durham investigation found that there had, there had never actually been a legal basis to justify the investigation of Russia collusion. And the intelligence agencies are partly responsible for uh, creating a, a fictitious, you know, creating a supposed legal base turned out to be a fiction. But Schumer was also right in predicting that these agencies would have their revenge. Uh, Trump came into office intending to create better relations with uh, Russia, but the actions of these agencies and, of course, their spokesmen in the media uh, really forced Trump to change his policies. Trump was, was, consider was being accused over and over again of treason by having, wanting to have good relations with Russia. And against the background of the Russia collusion charges, he was pressured into basically reversing his policies and becoming a, a, a much more harsh towards Russia than he intended to be. 
so in fact, in short, in uh, the accusation of the Ru of Russia co collusion had a uh, crippling effect on the first two years of his presidency. Uh, now, I could mention also this, the last two years of his presidency with all of the Ukraine stuff. I, it's another, again, it's another example I'm not going to go into. But uh, what, uh, finally, I wanted to bring up this point, that one of the, one of the efforts of the agencies to prevent Trump's re-election in 2020 was a, le was a letter signed by 53 former employees of the agencies, these, these intelligence agencies, falsely claiming that the New York Post, Post revelations of the, of the Hunter Biden's laptop information, which, was, which contained information about Trump engaging in corrupt deals, um, <laughs> Biden. <laughs> It, it, sorry? Yeah, I mean, that was it. Yeah, Biden was, in, was shown to be engaging in corrupt deals, and the, uh, but this was, but they, but, you know, everybody, everybody in the intelligence agencies, former employees, to be sure, oh, no, that could never happen. And then, of course, it turned out to be true, as we now know. Uh, and not only that, but they, they managed, of course, because they had, they had made this claim, government was in a position to pressure, and the, the agencies were in a position to pressure the private sector, social media in particular, and, and also the public media. So in the places where Americans mostly get their news, and social media and public media, uh, internet, internet media, uh, there was a kind of blackout on this whole topic during the 2020 campaign. And some observers believe that that alone, that, inter that election interference alone was, was sufficient to carry what turned out to be a very close election for Biden, uh, leaving aside the question of, of other kinds of possible cheating in the election, which I do not rule out. <clears throat> the, uh, now, the, um, when, when Schumer implied that the agencies suffer no consequences, whether or not they follow the law, uh, he, certainly there's, there's evidence to say, to show that that's true. Uh, I was thinking of the case of Peter Navarro, who's come up recently. He's been prosecuted this year for contempt of Congress when he refused to testify against his boss. His, base, his crime was, right, not, I didn't show up to testify. Now, James Clapper, back in uh, 2013, during the Obama years, was director of national intelligence. Uh, and he was never prosecuted for lying to Congress. He uh, testified in Congress that the NSA had, been, had, had not been illegally compiling data on American citizens in violation of the Fourth Amendment. Edward Snowden revealed that Clapper was lying. Not only was Clapper not prosecuted, the White House immediately announced that Obama had, quote, full confidence, unquote, in him. That's what happens if you're a member of the intelligence agencies. They have six ways from Sunday to come after you, and you can't touch them. <clears throat> the, uh, uh, and of course, Snowden got the whole six ways from Sunday treatment, right? They have basically made it clear to him, if you come back here, you'll be in prison for life. Uh, he's currently living in exile in Russia. Uh, my second set of examples come from the judiciary. Uh, of course, it's not just the intelligence agencies who are involved in undermining the rule of law in America. Uh, they, too, are involved in this whole process. And I, I'm going to use a quote uh, from the 1960s when the judiciary became increasingly unmoored from statute as well as constitutional law, in my opinion at least, symbolizing that shift away from uh, respect for and enforcement of law was the influential David Bazelon. He was chief judge of the DC circuit in the 1960s and 70s. One of his former clerks, Alan Dershowitz, has this explanation or this quotation. Uh, if, a, uh, if a defendant deserved compassion, but no formal legal remedy was technically available to him, Basilon would wink at me and order that I find some ground for issuing a writ of rachmones. Rachmones is the Hebrew Jew Yiddish word for compassion. So in other words, <laughs> if there was no 
formal legal remedy that was technically evaded, meaning it wasn't, the law didn't support the outcome. That's just, you know, technically didn't support the outcome. Yeah, it didn't support the outcome that Bazelon wanted. So the wink and the, and the writ of Rachmanus. Bazelon's purpose was to change the law at wherever he had the opportunity to conform to the view that the law should not be like the famous statue where Lady Justice is blindfolded holding the scales Right? She doesn't see who the parties are in the case. She's just applying the same standard to both sides. And what Bazelon, together with his friend uh, Justice Brennan and other Supreme Court liberals did, was to rip the blindfold off of Lady Justice, to tell Lady Justice to make sure you know who, who, you know, who whom, right? who's benefiting and who's being harmed, and make your judgment on the basis of which side is the disadvantaged or the downtrodden or the victim. 